Well, welcome everyone to our uh, service uh, today at the Salford Community Church. And uh, if this is your first time with us, where we give you a very special welcome as we seek to uh, worship our Lord together as we come to uh, God's Word and the preaching of it. Let's just come and commit ourselves to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we come before you now and thank you once more for the fact that we are able to turn the pages of Scripture. And Lord, we especially pray uh, that uh, now at this time, uh, we call upon God the Holy Spirit to be our help and our assistance in this. Be conscious, Lord, that we can read words and that's as far as it goes. But this is your word. And we pray that God the Holy Spirit indeed will open our minds uh, to it, open our eyes to it, our ears, and especially that uh, your word would penetrate into our very hearts itself. Uh, we would say to you, O oh God, that we want to be hearers, listeners. We seek uh, that we might, through your spirit, understand your word, and that, Lord, we might be able also through the Holy Spirit to, to be those who will apply the word, uh, your word to us at this time. And we pray this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We're going to uh, begin by reading, uh, it's a very short passage, Genesis chapter 14. And we're going to read from verse 18 uh, to the end of the chapter. So Genesis chapter 14, verse 18 to 24. Now, this particular uh, section of uh, the, the book of Genesis is a situation in which Abraham has uh, had, to go to, had to go to battle. He had to go to battle to win back his nephew Lot. Uh, there's been a kind of civil war between kings and uh, uh, Lot uh, had been sort of captured and his family and Abraham musters uh, the servants and uh, presumably some of the people living alongside him and they were able to get a, a small army and able to rescue Lot and uh, bring the goods back. And so as uh, Abraham has come back from that uh, victory over uh, certain kings, he is met with a, a mysterious and enigmatic character, the man called Melchizedek. And we're going to be looking about, uh, thinking about Melchizedek again, as we did last time. Uh, but let's hear the word of God. Genesis 14, verse 18. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. Now the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord, most God, God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap, and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich, except only what the young men have eaten, and the portion of the men who went with me, Anna, Eshkol, and Mamre. Let them take their portion. Well, may the Lord add his, his blessing to his precious word at this time. Well, before we come to the preaching of God's word, let's, uh, let's come before the Lord in, in prayer. Father, we come before you and uh, we thank you that uh, from every part of the scriptures, whether it's Genesis or Lord, the book of Revelation, uh, you are speaking to us through your word. And in the word of God, we praise you and thank you that through its pages, there's that uh, light that shines uh, in it, 
of revealing Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Lord. And even in this man, Melchizedek, who uh, we, we speak of as a type for Christ because he's a king and a priest. Lord, he's just a, a reflection of the one king and the one priest, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. We thank you that the Lord Jesus is indeed the King of Kings, and that one day he will come down from earth, come down to earth, and uh, Lord, recreate heaven and earth and establish his kingdom, and all your people will be gathered with him, and that for eternity. We thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ is a priest, and that he offered himself as the Lamb of God uh, on that, uh, that cross at Calvary, and that he uh, uh, offered that sacrifice of himself, that one and only sacrifice for sin. Thank you, Father, that the Lord Jesus Christ, as our great high priest, is seated at your right hand, and he intercedes for us. And Lord, we need his intercessions at this time, because, Lord, the world is in such a disarray, uh, because of this pandemic, uh, because of the economic uh, disasters that are happening in all the countries of the world, it seems, and because, Lord, of all the sickness and illness and deaths that are going on. And, Lord, as we, today, as we uh, are going to be proclaiming your word, we hear the news, Lord, that... Uh, more places in this country of ours is, are being locked down, more problems because of uh, students and uh, uh, having this virus and spreading it. And Lord, we must, uh, we must confess before you that we wonder where things will end up. But uh, Lord, we come before you as the sovereign God, uh, the one who knows all things. But you, was, you planned the beginning and you planned the ending. And so, Lord, you know all about this. And, uh, Lord, we believe that as we trust you in these things, that there is a purpose behind it. We pray that the purpose, Lord, will be for the fervence of the gospel. We pray that it may be uh, to the saving of precious souls. We pray, Father, that it will be uh, forming and fashioning and building your church so that you would have glory and honor. And we thank you, Lord, we who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ, that we're part of that. Lord, we're told by Peter that we're living stones that are building up your house with Jesus, the, co the chief cornerstone, and we praise you and thank you. And we pray, Father, that you will continue to build your church. And we know because Jesus told us that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So even in this way, even in these ways of preaching online, then, Lord, we pray that you will be honoured and glorified. We pray that the gospel message will go forth, not simply from this place, but uh, all the churches that love Jesus. Lord, may there be when all this is done and settled and the pandemic has been um, swept away, as it were, we might discover that you have done a great thing. And it was marvellous in our eyes. But uh, for now, Lord, we pray that you would give wisdom and knowledge to those who lead us as a nation. Pray for the leaders of the world as well in their decision-making and uh, the things that they may have to do. Pray, Father, that you would keep people uh, safe and that, Lord, uh, through their, the ministry of these leaders, uh, saved, lives would be saved. And that, uh, Father, uh, some time we pray soon, we might be able to behave in a normal fashion and especially pray, Lord, that we might be able to meet in a godly fashion in your house on the Lord's day. As, Lord, once we, once we knew and how, Lord, we long for such days again. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, 
Let's turn to the scriptures as we begin uh, to look at uh, this passage, Genesis chapter 14, and the one that we read, verses 18, and really down to verse uh, 21. Now, last time, we had been thinking about this, uh, what I described as a mysterious and enigmatic character from the scriptures, uh, from the Old Testament. This man who is called Melchizedek. And uh, he was the, the man we've already mentioned, I think, uh, Abraham met after he had come back from the so-called Battle of the Kings, and where Abraham was able to rescue his nephew Lot and his family. And last time we discovered a number of things about this man, Melchizedek. We discovered his name. Melchizedek means king of righteousness. That was his name. Uh, signifying his character, signifying his uh, godliness. Uh, we discovered where he lived. He lived in Jerusalem. He was called the King of Salem, and Salem is the old name for Jerusalem. He had a title, Priest of God Most High. Again, signifying his spirituality, his godliness, his faith and trust in, in God, Jehovah God. And uh, as we saw last time as well, he was considered by the writer to the Hebrews as one who was greater than Moses, uh, greater than Abraham, sorry, greater than he Abraham, because he blessed Abraham. But we're going to consider this man Melchizedek, Melchizedek again, and we've got some more things to say about him. And the first one is this, he gave Abraham a meal. He gave Abraham, Melchizedek gave Abraham a meal. Uh, and we see that recorded for us in uh, chapter 14 of Genesis and verse 18. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, we're told. And then we are told he was the priest of God most high. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. <coughs> Now, there's something that we must not do when we get a text like this in the Old Testament. And it's this. It's not, it's, we shouldn't take the Old Testament verse that we have here, for example, and put it into a New Testament setting. We'll be very careful about doing things like that. Uh, some of the old Victorian commentators, uh, they came across the words bread and wine, and they immediately started thinking about communion. And they were saying in their commentaries, well, this is Abraham and Melchizedek. They're having communion. Uh, Melchizedek is the priest, and he's giving bread and wine to Abraham. And they start thinking in terms of uh, how this was a, a, a foreshadowing of what Jesus was going to do in the upper room with his disciples. Well, uh, they're wrong. They shouldn't have applied it in that way, because uh, what does being meant by these, this, these words in verse 18 of bread and wine. It's really just a Hebrew way of saying that Melchizedek brought Abraham a meal. It's an idiomatic speech, meaning a meal was set before Abraham. But let's ask a question. Why did Melchizedek give Abraham a meal? Well, I think the way to answer that question is to ask another question. And the other question is, why do we give somebody a meal? Or why should we give somebody a meal? Well, I've got four, four reasons why we could give somebody a meal. First of all, it could be because we want to get to know someone. Uh, and we want to be hospitable. Perhaps it's somebody that we've only just uh, met and uh, it might be a, a neighbor that's just arrived next door and we want to be friendly and we want to invite them around for a meal. Uh, in a church context, it might be a, a, a new person coming to the church and uh, we want to get to know them uh, a little bit, so we invite them back for a Sunday lunch. And here we've got two uh, men of God, haven't we? We've got Melchizedek, uh, the priest of God most high. Here, here we have Abraham. Uh, trusting in God, leaving his father's land to go to the promised land. And there's a sense in which the two of them, 
uh, and I'm, I'm suggesting that they've, they've not met before, but they recognize in each other that, these are, that they are servants of uh, the Most High God, and they want to get to know each other and uh, rejoice together as believers in God. Now, that's uh, one uh, possibility, isn't it, uh, of why that meal was given. But there's another reason why we would give a meal. Perhaps it's a case of a celebration. It's someone's birthday. Uh, someone's got promotion. And perhaps Melchizedek here, in bringing this meal to Abraham, is, uh, is part of the celebrating. Uh, celebrating that uh, God had used Abraham. Uh, and, and God had given the victory. And that uh, celebrating what, what God has done. Another might be, of course, that uh, a meal is given out of necessity. Uh, someone needs a meal. After a battle, we can imagine that uh, Abraham, uh, with all uh, the hours spent in battle, might need sustenance. He might need food to recover. His energy levels have got low. Uh, he needs to eat. He hasn't got time to prepare anything. And here's this meal given to him by Melchizedek. Or well, again, the fourth thing might be this. It's a thank you. And sometimes it's nice to be appreciated. Uh, and maybe all those things are true of why Melchizedek uh, uh, gave that meal to Abraham. But how do we apply this uh, to ourselves at this time? Well, I want to say this, that hospitality in a church context is important for gospel work. Hospitality is important for gospel work. By it, for example, we can encourage the saints. I remember as a, a student uh, in Swansea, uh, a PhD student, which meant that I was sort of neither an undergraduate or a member of staff of the university, and it was quite a lonely, lonely time in some ways. But I can remember going to church, and there was a, a godly couple in the church who often invited me back on a Sunday for lunch. And as a poor student, I needed some, some good food. But that was a great encouragement to me, to meet with brothers and sisters in, a, in an informal setting. It's a great encouragement, then, uh, to give hospitality in that way. But it's, a, it's also a way of, of sharing the gospel. Uh, there's a wonderful um, verse, it's, uh, no need to turn to it, but it's Acts chapter 18 and verse 26. Uh, there we have uh, the account where Paul has gone to Corinth and he's left two of his friends, husband and wife, Priscilla and Aquila there in Ephesus. And along uh, comes a man called Apollos. And Apollos is a very much a, uh, an orator. And he's in the synagogue and he's sharing his testimony, as it were, his, what he understands about the gospel. It's not the full gospel. He, what he understands is, comes from John the Baptist. And there's this verse here in Acts 18, verse 26, which says that when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside. Uh, the New International Version translates it like this, uh, that they invited him to their home. I think they might have stretched the, uh, the Greek a little bit there. But it gives us a picture, doesn't it, uh, 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 of how they have came alongside this man. And then we're told in verse 26, and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Now, I've got this picture in my mind. Uh, uh, it's, it's a Saturday, which is uh, the, the Jewish uh, Sabbath. They've all gone to the synagogue. Apollos has, uh, has done a bit of preaching there. And he's told them what he understands. And they come alongside Apollos and say to him, how about coming back to our place for Sabbath lunch? And uh, there they've got their, well, I suppose it must be roast lamb. They wouldn't have roast pig, roast pork, would they? But they'd perhaps they have some roast lamb. And there over that meal, that Sabbath lunch, they tell him about Jesus, and he tells him about perhaps the Paul and what Paul had been preaching, and he comes to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, doesn't he? Another important role as well in this aspect of hospitality is that I think it's an important role in keeping the unity of the fellowship of the church. And I know here at Salford, uh, we're, uh, from, 
from some experience now uh, that we're very good at this church meals. Uh, the shame is that we can't we can't do it at the moment because of the COVID uh, regulations. But I'm looking forward to that day when we can get together. So uh, that that's the first thing that uh, Melchizedek uh, gives a meal uh, to Abraham. But the second point uh, is this. Abraham gave Melchizedek a tenth, or as the scripture tells us, a tithe of everything. Uh, Abraham gave Melchizedek a tenth of everything. And we, we find that recorded for us in Genesis, again, chapter chapter 14 and verse 20. Now, Melchizedek has blessed Abraham. And he's given him a, a wonderful blessing. Blessed be Abraham, this is verse 19. Blessed be Abraham of God, most high, possessor of heaven and earth. Blessed be God, most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And then at the end of that, verse 20, it says, and he gave him a tithe of all. A tithe of everything. Now, as far as I know from Scripture, uh, this is the first time that uh, the giving of a tithe, the giving of 10% of something is mentioned. And it's, it's not too many chapters later on that it's mentioned again, but this time in the life of Jacob. Uh, Jacob, as he's fleeing uh, from his brother, uh, meets with God. And he, he vows to God that if God would keep him safe, uh, then he would, as we read in Genesis 28, verse 22, he says, I will surely give you a tenth uh, to you. I will surely give a tenth to you, he says Jacob. So there's that tenth, uh, that tithe. Now, it's a, it's a simple question, but I think it might have a more difficult answer. But it's a simple question. What did Abraham give Melchizedek? Now, some people like to say, well, it was a tenth of the spoil. Obviously, the, the goods, the kings have had their war, and they were sort of a spoil of war, and that Abraham uh, gave a tenth of the spoil of war. But I'm not sure that that's true, because when you get to verse 21, it seems that the, the king who has the spoil is the king of Sodom. And he's offering the spoil of war, that Abraham, and uh, Abraham, as we read in those verses, declines that. And he says, I don't want anything from you. <laughs> You're not afraid or, or, or a sandal strap, because I don't want you to say, I made Abraham, or a Abraham as he's called then, rich. So I don't think that's what he's giving him. He isn't giving him a tenth of the spoil. But rather, I think, as the scripture tells us, he gives him a tenth of everything, a tenth of all. Now, why does Abraham give this man, Melchizedek, a tenth, a tithe? Well, I think the answer is because he is priest of God Most High. He's God's servant. Um, there's some office that he has. It's not just a title, it's something that is a about Melchizedek. He is a priest of God Most High. And as a priest of God Most High, Melchizedek, as we, as we can see in verse 19 and verse 20, has actually uh, given a priestly blessing to Abraham. And Abraham is aware of that this, this man is a priest of God Most High. He's aware that this man is a, is a servant of God. And he gives that tenth, that tithe, for God's work. But uh, how do we apply that to ourselves uh, today? Well, perhaps, uh, again, we need to ask a question to ourselves. Are we, as believers in the Lord Jesus, as we, are we, as Christians, uh, are we giving everything we have as a tithe to God? Are we being serious about giving a tithe to the work of God. After all, everything that we have belongs to God in the first place. 
It's his. He's given us all the possessions. He's given us whatever wealth we may have. It is all originally come from God. And are we being scrupulous about giving a tithe to God? Now, I've got three questions I'm going to uh, pose. I'm not going to give you free answers. Uh, maybe it'll be something that uh, on another occasion when we meet together to discuss this passage, then we may raise these questions up. But here are three questions concerning this aspect of the giving of a tithe. First of all, do we pay a tithe on our gross income or only on uh, the income that we have after tax? Now, that's a big question, isn't it? Depends, if, depends on how much money you're earning, I suppose. Uh, secondly, is the tithe to, be, to God to be only 10% or could it be more? Is 10% uh, uh, the, the maximum or the minimum that we should be giving to God. And then the third thing is this. Is a tithe just about money? Or is it about the time that we can give to the Lord? Or even the property that we can give uh, to the Lord? In saying that, I recall a, a Christian that I knew of some years ago who uh, bought an old second-hand a uh, people carrier. Uh, he wanted a, a people carrier that had eight seats. And uh, he searched around and he found there was only one, one company that was making an eight-seat people carrier, and that was a Fiat. And I remember him going to the sort of the south coast, I think, from Swansea, in order to pick up this Fiat eight-seat carrier. So I asked him uh, about this, and he said, well, he wanted to buy this car, this uh, basically a van really, uh, I wanted to buy it to use for the Lord's work so that he could pick up people and bring them to church. I thought that was wonderful and he, said, and he also added that he was going to be using it for the young people's work. So here was a man who thought about it and thought I can buy a vehicle and use it for the Lord's work. Well there was some, there's some questions. But let me bring you on to a third point uh, now. Uh, we don't know the origins of Melchizedek. We don't know the origins of Melchizedek. Uh, we're going to move into the New Testament for our text uh, at this point. It's Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 3. Uh, the writer to the Hebrews, especially in chapter 7, has a lot to say about Melchizedek. And on another occasion, we're going to be thinking uh, a lot more about what the New Testament says about Melchizedek, and especially in his context or connection with uh, the Lord Jesus. But for now, it's verse 3. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 3. Uh, and this is what the writer tells us about the origins of Melchizedek. He says... Without father, without mother, without uh, genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually, or remains a priest for all time, is another way of translating that. So what can we say about Melchizedek? Well, Melchizedek is a real man. And as such, he is the descendant of Noah. And we're all descendants of Noah, if you think about it. Uh, Noah and his family. Uh, but that's about as far as we can say about his genealogy, isn't it? Now, that's, uh, a genealogy was something which was uh, quite important to Jewish people. Uh, in fact, we might say that uh, Jewish people were passionate about family history. And uh, you can see that if you look at the first chapter of Matthew uh, in the New Testament, because there you've got the whole list of family history uh, uh, of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, Melchizedek might have been something strange uh, to the Jewish people because he doesn't seem to have a family history. And the Jews always wanted to know who your father was or your grandfather and so on. A bit like the Welsh, really. If you meet a Welshman, 
And especially if, if you're called Jones, they'll not only want to know what your father's name was, they want to know what your grandfather's name was to find out which, which of the Joneses you were. But nonetheless, we can say this of Melchizedek, he has a spiritual heritage. There's a spiritual lineage uh, in Mel Melchizedek. He is priest of God Most High. And so I think that we can say this. At the very least, we can say that he is in the godly spiritual line of Noah. He is a believer in God. He is priest of God Most High. And just as he is a believer in God, so Abraham is a believer in God. But there's a sense in which they're not from the same kind of family line. Abraham uh, is to be the start of a, a new spiritual family line, isn't he? He's going to be uh, the father of all who believe, who have faith. He's the man who, uh, by faith, is saved. And it's not of works. Melchizedek is perhaps the, the end of that uh, Noah, uh, Noahic spiritual line. And so, in one sense, as, we, uh, as uh, I was thinking of a title for this sermon, we, we can understand that this is a, a passing of the spiritual baton from Melchizedek, one of the old saints, if you like, uh, with his descendancy from Noah, passing on the spiritual baton to Abraham, who is going to be the father of all who believe, as Paul tells us in, Rome, in Romans. But how do we apply this? Well, an application for this is to realize that uh, not all believers have the same spiritual heritage as we do. Not every true believer comes from a, a, a solid evangelical or reformed background. Not every Christian believer uh, has the same Christian books on their bookshelves as we do. Not all believers uh, use the same Bible translations that we do, or like the same spiritual hymns that we do. And perhaps on uh, secondary issues, but not primary, there may be a real gulf in difference. But if they love Jesus, that's all that matters isn't it? You see, sometimes we can be so narrow that uh, we, for we forget that there, are, that there are others who seek to love Jesus and who seek to serve Jesus. Others, perhaps, uh, who don't cross the, the, the T's and dot the I's that we do. Uh, and perhaps we need to have a, a broader view, a vision of, of the family of God at times. And, so, sure, and certainly we need to rejoice and to celebrate when we meet uh, fellow believers in Jesus. That's what I think Melchizedek is doing with Abraham. That's why the meal was there, I think. There was a celebration. Here's yeah, a fellow believer in God. Even if they do come, as it were, from two different spiritual backgrounds and when we meet Christians from different backgrounds you know we can rejoice and celebrate with them if they love Jesus and believe in Jesus after all <laughs> we're going to be with them in eternity and that's a long time well next time and I wanted to share with you what we'll be looking at next time but next time we're going to continue with thinking about Melchizedek, but as I intimated, we're going to be thinking of Melchizedek and what the New Testament says about him and his uh, connection that is uh, used, especially in the, the letter to the Hebrews, that connection uh, of Melchizedek and Jesus. Amen. Well, let's, uh, let's bow our heads in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we praise you and thank you for this meeting of two men of God. Uh, Melchizedek, that uh, undoubtedly uh, a man who 
must have served the Lord for many, many years. Uh, the priest of God Most High. And Abraham, uh, who uh, in one sense has just uh, hasn't journeyed very far on that spiritual journey. There's still much that he has to learn and there's still a testing of Abraham to come because, before he becomes Father Abraham, the father of all who believe. And so, Father, we thank you that we're on a spiritual journey too and like Abraham, there will be much uh, to learn, uh, much experiences to have. Uh, but we pray, Father, that we would have a large heart uh, especially, Lord, when we see brothers and sisters that perhaps normally we wouldn't uh, have much to do, but Lord, help us to recognize them as your children, your servants, and to welcome them. And Lord, like Melchizedek, perhaps also bless them in the name of Jesus. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that is at work in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen.